run a company called Journey for the Soul. I ran the National Voting Rights Museum and Institute here for almost 20 years. In fact, I'm one of the founders of the museum because I felt it was necessary that our stories be told and that we be the ones who tell our stories. We are still alive. There's no reason for you to get it wrong. <laughs> Also, love what I do. I get to touch thousands each year, particularly young people who are searching um, for guidance. I can't tell them where to go. I can tell wrong folks where to go most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, you dirty minded you to care. <laughs> That's exactly what I do sometimes. But the young people have to understand that if we knew the path that they were supposed to take to get us where we're supposed to be, we'd already be there. They wouldn't have to do anything. We'd already be there to be a perfect world, and our children would not be searching for a way to get to somewhere we should have had them already. When I was growing up here in Selma, I grew up during a time when segregation was the norm. When because of the color of my skin, I couldn't do a lot of things. In fact, my grandmother, Sylvia Johnson, came to live with us after my mom died. She came home to bury her only daughter, who had died in the halls of our white hospital here. You see, my mother needed a blood transfusion, and they didn't have any black blood. I'm, I'm 60 now, and I haven't found out what black blood is yet. <laughs> but grandmother was a little different from most of the women around here. She had lived in Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, people who live above the Mason Dixon line seem to have what I call that Mason Dixon mentality. They think that all the bad things happen in the South. <laughs> it doesn't happen in places above the Mason Dixon line, like Connecticut. New York City. Yeah, 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 yeah. Man, that's who got called the N word in New York. Mm. Um, grandmother said, we we'll talk to the women in our community about how nothing had changed in the 35 years she had lived. Same people in power, same old nasty segregationist, same segregationist laws. And gr grandmother said, that can't still be happening in the South. But it was. Somebody introduced her to a lady named Amelia Boynton. Y'all know me Boynton. No. She's my Shiro. Say Shiro. Shiro. Add it to your vocabulary. <laughs> anyway, somebody introduced her to Mrs. Boynton, and Mrs. Boynton had, and her husband Sam had formed the Dallas County Voters League. And grandmother started going to the meetings. She would take us to the meetings, and we had to sit quiet at the feet of those history makers while they strategized on how they were going to get this thing called free. Now, I thought I was the smartest person in that room. <laughs> My teacher had already told me Abraham Lincoln freed the slave. <laughs> I grew up during a generation of children who were supposed to be seen and not heard. Y'all don't know that about that, don't play. <laughs> we had to sit quietly at the feet of those history makers while they strategized on how they were going to get this thing called freedom. Now, I wasn't about to say that at all. I just sat there smug in my belief. One day we were right on Broad Street, and Carter's Drug Store is still here. Maybe some of, some of you noticed that. Well, Carter's had a lunch counter at that time. And I wanted to sit at that lunch counter, but Grandma said I couldn't. And so she said, colored children can't sit at the counter. It didn't stop me from wanting to sit at that counter. Every time I pass by, I see those white children sitting there licking those ice cream cones, drinking those milkshakes out, those beautiful glasses, twirling around on that stool. I wish it was me. 
Mm-hmm. But one day, grandmother was talking to one of her friends and part of the store. And I did, I was doing what I always do, peeping that woman, mm-hmm. watching those white kids, wishing it was me. Mm-hmm. Grandmother noticed that day, and she leaned over my shoulder, and she pointed in that woman, she said, when we get our freedom, you can do that too. I became a freedom fighter that day. <laughs> <laughs> instantly that the freedom that Grandma and Miss Boynton and the rest of the, the old folks, as I call them, were fighting for was much different than the freedom that my teacher was talking about, the one Abraham Lincoln had given me. It was a, a big difference. Grandma had the good freedom. I started going down to the church, First Baptist Church, where I've seen it today. First Baptist was SNCC headquarters. They tried to teach me the principles of non-violence, but I flung. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in George Washington Carver home. Um, the housing project. And the side I grew up on had three bedrooms in each apartment. And you had to have at least four kids to get those three bedrooms. So every household had, had four children in it. And we would come outside. You as parents know that each child needs 100 feet each not to fight. <laughs> <laughs> they need 100 square feet, all their own, when nobody will invade it. You can't do that in the project with four kids in each house. If you didn't fight back when you came out that door, and you know the only principle I could really understand was the one where they say, turn the other cheek. <laughs> if I had turned that other chick, I've been doing this all day long. <laughs> uh, okay, what happened? And when they start the training, I'd fight back. Reverend Bevel, James Bevel, used to tell the story of me biting him on his knee. He had us sitting on the floor in the circle, and as close as I could get, I was trying to bite him higher. <laughs> but I did it. After that, my sister was safe when the Bernard Valdez training started. She was safe. Go outside and play. I'd go too. I'd go right on outside and play. I like the marching. I like the spirit of the movement, the songs. They ain't gonna let nobody turn us around. Woke up this morning, being with my friends, not going to school. I liked all of that. <laughs> When the march, when they line up for the march, I go get in the march. Like I said, they're training all day. We would go down to our courthouse. You know we wasn't old enough to register. So they wouldn't let us in. They locked the doors. They locked the doors and someone would, we would kneel on the steps of the church and someone would say a prayer to the Creator, asking him to lift the hearts of those evil men so that our parents could vote for us and we could vote for ourselves. You know, they got old quick with the establishment. They started <laughs> rolling yellow school buses up in front of the courthouse and loading us up on those buses and taking us to jail. They would put us in cells that were supposed to hold two people at the most. I've never been in a cell that had less than 40, 60 people all jammed up here. If you were lucky or unlucky enough to get the, the bed, you ain't sit there long. There was no mattress there, just that metal frame with that lip right in front to keep the mattress from going off. It would cut into your thigh you sat there long enough. Toilet, middle of the floor, no privacy. With that many people in a room, you don't want to be nowhere near the, a toilet. Trust me, I know. Food, dry beans. For those of you who cook beans or have seen them being cooked, you know, you can't just open that pack and put it in that water. You gotta pick out the stuff you can't eat. The dirt, the rocks, the insects. Nobody did that for us. I think they took pride in bringing us plates with big old rocks sitting up on them. You wouldn't have eaten it, would you? Girl, by that third day, you'd have been so hungry. You'd have pushed that rock aside and hope you couldn't identify what you were crunching on. 
Those things were done to break our spirits. We were as low as we could go. They let us out. We go home, take a bath, get a good meal, be right back up in their faces. Oftentimes going back to jail the same day. By the time I was 11 years old, I had been in jail 13 documented times. <laughs> oh, and I was by far not the youngest. If you were there, you went to jail. In December of 1964, a letter was written by Dr. Frederick Douglass Reese, F.D. Reese. He's the pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church. At that time, he was the pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church. <laughs> he was also, he was also the president of the Dallas County Voting League. He wrote a letter to a man named Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., inviting him to Selma, asking him to come and help and speak on Emancipation Proclamation Day. Dr. King accepted. He already knew of the work that the League had been doing for 30 some odd years. He already knew of the work that SNCC had been doing here. Dr. King came and he brought in his lieutenants and he stationed them in counties all around us. He sent Reverend James Armour to Mary. I understand you guys went to Mary in the day. Reverend Armour found it easier to organize students. After all, their parents worked for the people who were trying to keep us from getting the right to vote. They marched on that courthouse and they were arrested, including Reverend Armour. Reverend Orange himself told me that about 3 o'clock that day, a state trooper came into the area where he was housed with a rope. On the end of that rope was tied a noose. Reverend Orange said he threw it over the top of his cell and that noose hung in his face all day long. He had to sit there knowing that maybe his last day on earth. That evening they let the children out. A mass meeting was being held at the church up on the corner. They ran into the meeting and said, you have to do something now. They're going to kill him. The people in the church decided to march down to the courthouse. I'm sorry, to march down to the jail. In hopes that their mere presence would save this man's life. When they left the church, they were attacked and brutally beaten by law enforcement officers. A young man named Jimmy Lee Jackson emerged from the church just in time to see a trooper beating his grandfather his 82-year-old grandfather. Jimmy's mother saw him beating her father, too, and she ran over. As she approached that trooper, drew back his big club to hit her. Jimmy did what I would have done. He shot him. Jimmy died eight days later here in Selma at Good Samaritan Hospital. It was then that the leaders decided to walk through Selma to my daughter. One to protest this young man's sense of his death. The other to demand the right to vote from our then Governor George Wallace. On March 7, 1965, we left from the playground area of George Washington Carver Homes and led by John Lewis and Hosea Williams, came right down Broad Street and over this bridge and met a wall of policemen. And that last stop, John Lewis asked permission to pass. The policeman said there would be no march between Selma and my brother. <coughs> You have two minutes to disperse and go back to your church. In one minute and 15 seconds, they attack. I was too far back in the line to hear or see what was happening. I didn't need to. I was a warrior. I knew the procedure. I knew when I crested that bridge and saw that line of policemen, we were not going to Montgomery. I also knew that when John Lewis and Hosea Williams got as far as they could go, one of them would ask permission to pass. It would be denied. John Lewis and Hosea Williams would go down on their knees and we would follow suit. I'm standing there waiting for the, the line to start to go down. When suddenly I heard gunshots and screams, I thought they were killing the people down front. Before we could turn to run, it was too late. They came in from both sides, the back and the front. And they were just beating people. Old, young, black, white, male, female, it didn't matter. They were just beating people. 
You know what I remember the most? The screams. People screaming and screaming and screaming. People are everywhere, not moving, bleeding as, as if they were dead. And you couldn't stop to help them or you'd be beaten too. If you could outrun those men on foot, you couldn't outrun the ones on horses. They were running horses right into the crowd. People were being trampled, bones were being broken. The gunshots I heard, they were not gunshots. They were tear gas canisters being shot into the crowd. Tear gas burns your eyes, gets in your lungs. You can't breathe, you can't see, you panic. All the time you run right back to the same people you're running from. It seemed like it lasted an eternity. The last thing that I remember on that bridge that day is seeing this horse and this lady. And I don't know what happened. Did he run over her with the horse? Did he hit her and she fell? I don't know. I do know. As I stand here, 48 years later, I can still hear the sound my head made when it hit that pavement. The next thing I remember is being right over here across the street by the interpreter center. Of course, it wasn't the interpreter center. Either. In the back of a car. My head was in my sister Linda's lap, and Linda was crying. I became fully awake. I realized what was falling on my face were not my sister's tears. It was her blood. My 14-year-old sister had been beaten on that bridge and had wounds in her head that required 26 stitches. Yet, on that Tuesday, I held that same sister's hand as we followed Dr. King and Dr. Abernathy across that bridge again. When I crested that bridge and saw that same line of police, when I don't mind telling you, I didn't want no more freedom. Whatever the cost of that freedom was, it was too much for this 11 year old. I tried to go back. My sister and her friends held my hand and they kept talking and talking. And finally, somebody said, They're not going to beat Dr. King. I didn't believe that, but I went. This time, Dr. King asked permission to pay. Well, even told him the same thing. There would be no march between Selma and Montgomery. But this time, the front went down. Dr. Abernathy said a prayer. And after prayer, he and Dr. King stood up and led us back to Brown Chapel Henry Church, where he held a mass meeting and told us he had applied for a court order that would give us the legal right to walk from Selma to Montgomery if we so wanted to. But more importantly, be protected. It was signed by a judge in Montgomery named Frank Johnson on March 17, 1965. Four days later, on March 21st, we left Brown Chapel one more time. Came down Broad Street and over that same bridge. And those same policemen who beat us up on the seven had to protect us all the way from Selma to Montgomery. It took five days to get to the chapel. There are no motels between Selma and Montgomery today. There were none then. People slept on the ground. Started raining on the second day. Nobody turned around. Everything had to be brought to them. Yet nobody turned around. They kept going. And do you know, August 6th of that very same year, the Voting Rights Act was signed, and it removed those obstacles that prevented us from voting. Here in Dallas County, which Selma is the county seat, we went from 250 African Americans on the voting rolls to 9,600 almost mm -hmm. immediately. And it still took us 36 years to get rid of the same mayor. Go fit. <coughs> Wonder why it took us 36 years to get rid of the same mayor. The same mayor that was on that bridge in 1965 was our mayor to the year 2000. Oh. Wow. Yeah, we have a majority of African Americans. <coughs> well, I did learn one thing. It's just not good enough to vote, is it? It's just not good enough to have the right. It's not just not good enough to go to the polls. You gotta be involved in the whole process when you're deeper. Because who was counting those votes? 
Who was counting? The same people who didn't want us to have the right to vote. Maybe they're one plus one, it's not your one plus one. <laughs> we got rid of them in 2000. That very same year, we elected the first African American mayor here in Selma. A group, a group was formed called the Friends of Fox. Huh? Friends of Bars. Uh -huh. Say it again, say it again. For Forest. Forest. Yeah, I'm from the South, it's Fars. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what language all over there, so that must be the dead here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm from Mississippi. <laughs> I was talking to you, I thought I was talking to an evil. You were taking up for the for some reason. Stick together. Anyway, let me tell you, let me tell you this. They erected a statue on the grounds of one of our museums here <laughs> of Nathan Bedford Farr. Oh, yeah. oh, see, I, I, live, I live in Forest County. Uh -oh. And it's named for him. You just tore up from the floor. Be quiet. <laughs> Mississippi, this year in, in <laughs> bars. Don't say another word. <laughs> 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 